Good morning, everyone. My name is Liz. Uh, this is our Virtual Learning Academy program presented today by Lauren Stewart, who is a naturalist with ODNR and is currently at Maumee Bay State Park. She is going to be presenting today on outdoor hazards. Thank you so much, Lauren, for providing this program for us. Absolutely. I'm super excited. So um, I'm going to be focusing on the hazards of being in the great outdoors, which there are some. We're pretty fortunate in Northwest Ohio. We don't have as many as maybe if you went down to the southern parts of the United States, but we still do have some and you still have to be cognizant of them and uh, know what you need to look out for. Uh, the big ones, uh, poison oak, poison sumac, and poison ivy. Um, believe it or not, we only really have two of these and only one of them is found throughout the state. So um, poison ivy is gonna be the one that you're most likely to come in contact with. We do have poison sumac within the state. In Northwest Ohio, we're pretty much in the clear. However, we don't really have to worry about poison oak. Now, if you go down to more Southern United States, that's where you start to have to worry about it. But for us, poison ivy is the big one. Now, poison ivy, though, you might know the saying, leaves of three, let it be, but uh, what's interesting about poison ivy is it's a really important natural resource for a lot of different animals. Um, humans, not so much. We don't necessarily like the reaction we get from the aerosol oils because um, we get the dermatitis and the skin reaction. However, uh, poison ivy is an important food source for a lot of birds. And fun fact, there is only one other animal that reacts the same way to humans as humans do to poison ivy and it is pigs because they have a very similar type of skin. So everybody else doesn't have an issue. Um, actually, if you want to get poison ivy removed from your property, goats and sheep are excellent. Goats really like the taste of poison ivy, but birds love their berries, which to, we're good for poison ivy, but to our detriment spreads them pretty easily. So here's um, poison ivies are, poison ivy is a flowering plant and you can kind of see these flowers, they are, um, they're very, very subtle. They're not um, super vibrant or super bright. They're just gonna be that light kind of lime green. They kind of blend in. They look very similar to um, a tomato flower, but with that lime green coloration. Um, here they're about berries. Their berries are not ripe. As they ripen, they'll get darker. Um, but what's really neat about poison ivy, besides providing a really good natural food source for our birds, uh, poison ivy actually has an excellent fall color. Uh, so it's a great to admire from a distance, but it's not something that you wanted to get too close to. And unfortunately, it's a plant that we really don't like to have on our personal properties because of the fun reaction that we can get to it. A commonly mistaken plant for poison ivy is Virginia creeper. Uh, Virginia creeper is a native plant. You're not going to have that dermatitis reaction to it like you will poison ivy. Um, it does not contain that aerosol oil. Also, excellent fall color. And the biggest difference between poison ivy and Virginia creeper that you can see easily, they're going to have five leaves. They have palmate uh, leaves. So they're going to have in fives rather than threes, fives. They also have this pretty distinct serration on the edge of the leaf that poison ivy, as you can see, are going to be a lot more smooth or they're going to look a little lobed. So that is the big difference between Virginia creeper and poison ivy leaves a five. However, they both have excellent fall color. Virginia creeper, really, really important to our native birds. Excellent plant to add to your uh, native plant garden. And the vines do really well, but they're not going to be big enough or heavy enough to take down fences or things like that. So they're a really good addition. So poison sumac. They're only, so you only really have to worry about them in the wetlands. Here in Northwest Ohio, we don't really have them. Um, poison sumac looks very similar to a lot of our native sumacs. But again, you can have that same reaction to it as like poison ivy, but the berries on the poison sumac are gonna be white. A lot of our native sumacs do not have those white berries, That the native sumacs that don't give us that reaction don't have those white berries. So that can really help distinguish it for you as well. Uh, staghorn sumac and smooth sumac can get confused for that. But as you can see, the stark differences between those white berries and you're getting these red seed heads. So a lot different in terms of, especially if you can get the fruiting bodies of this plant, you can really tell the difference. Staghorn sumac and smooth sumac are both found commonly in wetlands as well. So you're more likely to be seeing these plants than the poison sumac itself. Now, another big one that can be a wetland invader is poison hemlock. Uh, poison hemlock is well-named. It is 
very, 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 very toxic. It will kill you. Um, a commonly confused species is Queen Anne's lace, but the big difference between poison hemlock, it gets absolutely huge. Talking like six, eight feet, like it's a big plant. Um, it also has this purple spotting along the um, stem. So this one, especially if you have little kids or any animals, dogs that like to chew on things, you really want to make sure that um, you're not in, you're not encountering poison hemlock. Um, this is going to be more in the wet, low lying areas. Um, the Department of Natural Resources has a really good guide for invasive plants. Poison hemlock is one of them, and they have a really good breakdown on how to identify poison hemlock and what you should do if you do encounter it. So the plant I was talking about earlier that's commonly confused, Queen Anne's lace. Queen Anne's lace is going to be much more delicate. Um, if you kind of look at this, the flowering heads, uh, poison hemlock has more of like a globe shaped flower head, but Queen Anne's lace has a very flat shaped flower head. Um, the leaves of Queen Anne's lace is going to look like carrots. Now, poison hemlock has a very similar lacy leaf too as well, but they're, Queen Anne's lace is not going to have any of that purple spotting. Queen Anne's lace is also not going to get eight feet tall. You're looking at a three foot tall plant. So Queen Anne's lace, much more delicate, lacks that purple spotting. By far, much more common to encounter Queen Anne's lace than you're going to encounter a poison hemlock. So especially if you've encountered things like poison ivy, uh, there are some natural remedies. Uh, jewel weed is one of the ones. Um, it's a really cool plant found in the wetlands. Um, the Native Americans used to use it for uh, poison ivy skin rashes. It kind of helps. It's like has a cooling effect, and is they believe and people do believe that it can kind of counteract that dermatitis that you can get from it. Uh, cool things like cu cucumber slices, baking soda, water, apple cider vinegar can kind of help draw that out and stop the spread. Uh, but the best thing to do is to wash the affected area, um, remove your potential infected clothing, uh, because that is an oil, the uracil oil, what's in poison ivy that causes us to have that reaction and the oil sticks to things. So removing that clothing that can be potentially contaminated, throwing it immediately in the washer and washing any areas that may have been exposed is a big one. Um, hydrocortisone cream and then the calamine lotion are always good ones, especially if you do have a high, uh, more allergic to it. And um, unfortunately, like I have a coworker who's super allergic to poison ivy. Every time she encounters it, she actually ends up having to go to urgent care and get a big old steroid shot. So some people can be significantly more allergic to it than others. So that's just something um, to be cognizant of. Um, and then there's about 10% of the population that really don't have a reaction to it. So hopefully you're within that lucky category, but assume that you probably are gonna react to it within some degree. Okay. Which spiders are dangerous? So a uh, common misconception um, is those spiders are poisonous. People think spiders are poisonous. The difference between venomous and poisonous is basically how it makes you get sick. Uh, both venomous and poisonous animals can kill you, um, but a venomous animal injects essentially the poison, the venom into you to make you sick. So you can eat a venomous animal. You're only gonna get sick if that venomous animal bites you. So a good example of that is rattlesnakes. People eat rattlesnakes. You're only going to get sick of that rattlesnake. Besides, he doesn't want to be eaten, which he probably will, but um, it requires an injection. So a sting or a bite. So all spiders are venomous. Whether the venom is significant to humans is a different story. So the black widow spider is one of them that's going to be on the top left-hand side. And then the brown recluse are going to be two spiders that we really have to worry about. Uh, however, being in Ohio, we're pretty much in the clear for most of these, the most of the really venomous spiders that are significant to humans. There are black widow spiders here. And occasionally if you're in super Southern Ohio, you might encounter a brown recluse. But a big one that people often encounter that they're like, oh, it, it's big. It looks like it's, it, it looks like it should be medically significant to humans because of that bright yellow and black, the garden spider is not gonna hurt us. Um, it, the, bite, the bite will feel like a bee sting, but it's not going to cause a, an issue like the black widow spider may cause. These guys are great. They have big old webs. Um, they eat a lot of different uh, noxious insects, so we do like them. However, sometimes they might not choose the best place for their webs, maybe over a walkway. 
and things like that. But do you know the garden spider is not a spider that we have to worry about in terms of you're not going to have to be hospitalized after it bites you. Different story for the brown recluse. So the brown recluse is more of an issue if you're in the Gulf Coast states in the southern part of the United States. Um, the big issue with the brown recluse, um, they're also known as fiddleheads. And if you can see on that spider's head, it almost looks like there's a violin or a fiddle starting from the eyes and going back. Um, brown recluses are live up to their name because they're brown, but they're reclusive. They like to hide in places. Unfortunately, oftentimes that may be shoes or underneath areas that you're not really going to look for things. You might accidentally step on them. Spiders are not going out to look to hurt us. Their bite is only really to defend themselves because we are way too big for them to, to eat. So they're wasting their venom on us essentially by biting us, but it is, they're basically a last resort to say, hey, leave me alone. Um, the brown recluse, the issue with them is their venom necrosis. So it can cause gangrene and can be an issue, especially if left untreated. The black widow. So um, I have a funny story with the black widow. My uh, husband is not a fan of spiders and he's not super duper outdoorsy. And uh, we went camping at Lake Hope State Park. And I was talking to one of the naturalists there because that's what I do when I go to a state park or go find the other naturalists to talk to. And she was just telling me that she had a, she had a black widow spider in, on display. And Lake Hope State Park is in the Hawking Hills area. So it's in Southern Ohio. And I was like, oh, I didn't know we had black widows here in Ohio. I didn't even think about that. Um, I'm a native Texan, so I was used to having them down there. But up here, I was like, oh, I, didn't, I thought it was too cold. The black widow is up here in Ohio. And she's like, oh yeah, we found the spider in one of the bathrooms. I was like, oh, that's interesting. And that very night, we had a black widow spider on our tent. And my husband was not a happy camper. Um, black widows, again, are not going to bite unless they feel threatened. Um, I was able to scoop the spider off the cup and ceremoniously toss her into the woods, uh, much to my husband's chagrin. He was not a fan that he thought she was going to come back. We were good. But the black widow spiders are important to the ecosystem. So they do have medically significant venom. Um, however, it is, you're not likely to get any antivenom for them when, if you go to the hospital, they're going to treat you, they're basically going to do palliative care. So they're just going to treat you to make sure you're okay. Um, so, but they're pretty, pretty distinct. Even my husband who does not know many animals, he knew exactly that that was a black widow. I was hoping I was going to get it under the radar and just kind of release her in the woods and be like, oh yeah, it was just a big spider. No, he could tell. And that's that bright red hourglass on that big globular spider um, is a pretty good indicator. And there's not going to be many spiders that even closely resemble the black widow female. And they can also have red on their back as well. So a red and black spider doesn't automatically mean it's going to be a black widow. There's the red and black jumping spider, which jumping spiders are great. I, they're actually some of my favorite types of spiders. They're super inquisitive for being little tiny little creatures, but jumping spider does not have medically significant venom to humans. And again, super important to the ecosystem. Eats a lot of different bugs that we don't want to have buzzing around us. So we like the jumping spiders, but again, they have that red and black kind of, it's, it's almost like it's a false warning. It's a type of mimicry for other animals say, hey, leave me alone. I look like I'm super venomous, but they're not. So if you do get bitten by a spider and it can be any type of spider, um, make sure to wash the area with soap and water to prevent infection, because that's the biggest thing. Even the spiders that don't have medically significant venom, those garden spiders are pretty big. And if you get bit by them, which it would take a lot to get bit by them, they're pretty docile. Um, you're going to want to clean that area. Uh, cooling it off with an ice pack is another good thing, kind of help reduce the swelling. You may have some sort of local reaction, but for a spider that's not a black widow or brown recluse, you're not, you should not have the same reaction as you would to one of those. Um, if you cannot locate the spider and you believe you're having a reaction, definitely have a professional look at it because you never know, especially something like a brown recluse. Again, they're reclusive. So if you have a spider bag that all of a sudden is starting to give you a lot of trouble, definitely get that checked out. Ticks. Ticks are my least favorite. <laughs> I am not a fan of ectoparasites and ticks kind of freak me out. Ticks, unfortunately, carry a lot of different diseases. 
Um, the most medically significant one to us that is well known, it's going to be the Lyme disease. And that's going to be from our, uh, the deer tick. And unfortunately, ticks are everywhere. They're super easy to get. Um, they're not noticeable, unfortunately, a lot of times until they're attached and large. Um, I have pulled out more ticks than I can count off of me. Thankfully, none of them have been attached. And I believe it or not, I've gotten most of them from my yard, which is just crazy. But uh, Mommy Bay, on we have kind of a cyclical every couple of years, we have a boom of ticks and they are everywhere. Ticks like to go, so when they're, when they're small, they're going to go to the edges of grass blades and they're going to hope for a potential host to walk by and they're just going to kind of fall on that host. And unfortunately, humans can be that host sometimes. So uh, the big ones that we really have to worry about is the deer tick with Lyme disease. But there's a whole slew of different ticks. Um, there's actually the Lone Star tick can cause you basically to become allergic to red meat. So there's some different diseases that they can carry and different bacterial uh, diseases that they can carry, uh, again, that we have to worry about. So the two that you're really gonna find here, the dog tick and the deer tick. Um, the dog tick often found is on dogs or dog-sized animals. And this is just a different uh, way to kind of get an idea of what you're looking for. The dog tick is gonna have almost this like collar. It almost looks like it's wearing like a, um, a little white collar uh, neck, the female. The male is gonna have this like mottled look to it. Um, and again, ticks are, are pretty teeny tiny. I don't have a good reference point for you, but like think a small tick, like the tip of a pencil, like a sharpened pencil, that little bit of graphite. That's what you're really looking at. Now, when they engorge, they're going to be much, much bigger because they're filled with blood. Um, the black leg tick is going to lack um, most of that um, ornamentation. They're not going to really have any distinct white spots. And the lone star tick has that, the female is going to have that star, that dot in the middle, while the male is going to um, have a whiter body and a little bit of white on it as well. So how to remove a tick? There's a lot of different ways that people swear to burning the tick off, things like that. Unfortunately, that can cause more damage than good. You want to remove all of the mouth parts of the tick. So tweezers is best. Basically grab it and pull straight up as close as you can get to that head. And you don't, you want to pull steadily. You don't want to jerk or twist because that might leave the head embedded, which the head is going to, is the issue because that's what's carrying the potential diseases and bacteria. Um, make sure you really, really, really wash uh, that tick bite area and monitor it as well. Uh, especially Lyme disease, you tend to get that bullseye rash. So if you start to get a rash around that tick bite, you really want to go seek professional, a professional opinion on it and get tested. Um, what I always like to do, especially if I've ever found a tick attached, I save the tick because I want to make sure it's a deer tick, it's a dog tick and not a deer tick and things like that. And I just take a piece of scotch tape and I basically laminate the tick and I hold on to it and make sure I don't have a reaction. And if I don't have a reaction, then I can dispose of it. And I usually give it about two weeks before I dispose of my ticks, but I'm super paranoid. <laughs> Um, a great thing to do, especially if you're dealing with ticks, is preventative measures. So if you're in an area that you know may have ticks, so basically if you're walking through long grass, you really want to make sure you take um, some precautions. Uh, tucking, wearing light colored clothing is really important because you can see the ticks on you. Dark colored clothing, they're going to blend in and those ticks are small. Um, tucking your, your pants into your socks, basically not exposing any skin is a big one. Um, using uh, a, a insect repellent that contains DEET is a good one. And um, checking yourself afterwards. So ticks like to go in um, like the more, like the folds and more like compressed areas. So like waistbands where your sock elastic is around is another big place to check. Um, always make sure you check your head as well. Put your fingers through your hair. I've had more than once a tick coming off my hair and I've seen it crawling over my glasses, which is like horror movie stuff. I do not like ticks, but just make sure you check your head too. That's something that often gets, like we don't really think about ticks being in our hair. We think of them being on their, our body, but they can absolutely get on our head and on our hair as well. 
Um, and checking yourself after doing that long hike is really important. The first 24 hours when the tick is embedded is really important because you're, if you can, the quicker you can move it, the less likely you are to get anything. So make sure you are using tick precautions. Um, and again, check yourself after you are done with your hikes. So wasps and bees. So both of them are important pollinators. Um, basically the biggest difference, bees are fuzzy, wasps are not. Um, wasps are true predators. So they may be nectaring a little bit, but they're gonna actually go and uh, find out, find potential prey, insect prey. Um, prey is big as things like tarantulas. There's a tarantula hawk, which is a type of wasp that specializes in eating tarantulas. Up here in, in Northwest Ohio, we have the cicada killer, which are awesome. If you ever go to the Oak Openings region, Secor Metro Park always has a ton of them. They leave humans alone, but they're huge. They're like the size of your thumb. And they grab cicadas, they paralyze them and lay their eggs inside of them, bury them and the eggs hatch and eat the cicada. So wasps are a pretty interesting group. Bees, super important. They are our biggest pollinators. And we need bees because without bees, we don't have food. Both can live in colonies or solitary. They can be singular. They can live in a solitary lives or colony, uh, more uh, colonial lives. The solitary species are less likely to sing. And that's just because they don't have the backing of a whole colony. So if they can flee, that's going to be their choice. Wasps, however, don't, aren't one and done when, it turn, when it's uh, talking about stinging. They can sting multiple times. Bees sting, and that's basically a death sentence for bees. So um, that's just something to consider. A wasp, if you accidentally irritate wasps, you're not just going to get stung once, probably. You're going to get stung multiple times. Um, so there was a, uh, a doctor, Dr. Justin Smith, decided he wanted to uh, do a uh, pain index. And by doing that, he let himself be stung by multiple different types of stinging insects ranging from the fire ant all the way down to the tarantula hawk that I mentioned. Um, four is bad, four hurts. <laughs> so you can kind of see these descriptions of what it feels like to be stung. They go all the way up to, uh, the four is the big one, but depending on the index you're looking at, they can go up to 10. But um, I, I love his descriptions on what it feels like. Uh, the be an oven mitt that has a hole in it and you pull the cookies out of the oven and you burn yourself a little bit. Um, the, I wouldn't recommend being stung by a bullet ant or tarantula hawk wasp. Um, a running hair dryer being dropped into your bubble bath is his description to it. And he willingly got stung by these insects. So all of them are venomous. However, whether or not the venom is going to do anything but just hurt you or send you to the hospital is a different story. Uh, for the most part, most of these, it's just going to hurt a lot. However, if you are allergic to bees, um, usually are allergic to wasps and fire ants as well, that whole family. And so that's just something to be really cognizant of because especially this time of year, bees and wasps are everywhere. But again, they're important pollinators. So we do like them. The honeybee being the biggest one. Um, again, they're the reason for most of our food here in Ohio because they're, they're the ones pollinating it. And they're super important. Unfortunately, there's a lot of different risks that these bees have to face. Um, there's a lot of colony collapse and issues with that. So um, definitely have, providing great habitat for our pollinators is really important because we like to eat. The bumblebee is one of my favorites. Um, bumblebees are gonna be larger bodied. Um, they're gonna be super fuzzy and they're kind of, their name fits them well, bumble. They bumble around. They're not very uh, graceful, but they are fairly docile. I think they're adorable personally. Um, the hornet is one we often encounter. Um, hornets like to pick uh, maybe not the best places to do their nests. And usually their nests are going to be, they're going to have that paper mache look to them. Uh, a lot of wasps have that paper mache look. Um, that, that is all chewed up tree bark and wasp spit. They, they, make, they literally make their nests by wasp spit and chewed up tree bark and plant matter. Uh, the paper wasp or the, that one, that honeycomb that they usually like to do underneath the eaves of your houses, underneath water spigots, things like that. And then um, some, bee, some wasps and some bees can do um, uh, 
ground nesting. The cicada killers are one. There's actually a lot of ground nesting bees as well. But remember that wasps are predatory. So they will go into burrows and they will look for potential uh, prey items, not just flying in the air. So this one, uh, this may look absolutely terrifying, but uh, believe it or not, it's not something we really have to worry about it. This is neither a bee or wasp. This is a Dobson fly. Um, this is a male Dobson fly. And I can tell because if you look at the mouth parts, they have the huge mouth parts. Um, those pinchers can't really hurt us. Um, the females, however, are much shorter and hers can hurt, but it's just a pinch. It's not, no venom involved in here. Um, these actually start off as helgramites. So if you're a big fisher person, helgramites are a very sought after bait for fishing. And those helgramites turn into Dobson flies. So if you are stung or bit are stung by bees, um, the biggest thing is have make it, make sure you do not have an allergic reaction. If you have somebody else with you and you don't know if you're allergic, have them monitor you. Just like spider bites, wash the site with soap and water. You want to prevent that potential infection. Remove the stinger if you can. Uh, scraping over a, with a fingernail is the best way to do it or trying to use gauze, some rough cloth to kind of hook it and pull it out. Um, squeezing the stingers with tweezers or squeezing the area and squeezing the finger with tweezers can actually put it more in. Um, unfortunately, which is you want to get it removed. So it's a little bit different than something like a splinter. Um, reduce the spelling by applying ice and try to not scratch or mess with the potential um, wound site because that can actually increase infection. So when you're dealing with bees and wasps, and especially if you do know you're allergic, um, if you wear bright clothes, unfortunately that may attract some of the bees and wasps. Um, try to keep areas clean. Uh, avoid like, especially like bright red sodas. Don't have open containers of that. Um, that is like, hey, free food, high in sugar. They're gonna go for that. Um, and so trying to stay away from areas that potentially that bees or wasps may congregate. Um, a big one is that if bees sting you, and especially if they're colonial bees, they're going to release essentially a pheromone that says, hey, other bees come and help me, and more bees are going to come. So that's just something to, to be cognizant of. Africanized bees are a whole nother group of things. Uh, they are known for pursuing people and pursuing the potential threat much farther than honeybees would. Honeybees have a very short kind of zone where they'll basically defend Africanized bees, it's far. Um, so if the insect is in your vehicle, don't panic. Go ahead and stop, open the windows. And usually that is the most effective way to get potential insects out. And then if you are severely allergic, make sure you have a medical ID bracelet or something to indicate in case you are unconscious and you can't tell that you're somebody that you're stung by a bee or um, something that made you Go, go into anaphylactic shock and carry an EpiPen if possible. So dangerous cats. We do actually have dangerous cats in Ohio. We do have the native bobcat. Um, this is a bobcat kitten, which looks adorable. Bobcats, not the same as house cats. They are true predators. Um, they're pretty reclusive. You're unlikely to really encounter them unless they're sick, injured, or when they're young. Um, but they can get up to 35 pounds. So we're talking medium-sized dog but in cat form with cat claws and cat teeth and uh, the ability to climb and hunt efficiently. Um, another, and this one you're more likely to encounter is the saddleback. The saddleback actually is um, a venomous species of caterpillar. Uh, and it, so you see all these spikes along it. Um, those spikes have venom in them and it hurts. It hurts, it hurts, it hurts, it hurts. So this is a no touchy caterpillar for sure. So venomous cats, venomous caterpillar, dangerous cats. And let's, there we go. Uh, the buck moth caterpillar also is something that you have to kind of be cognizant of. Um, if a caterpillar has really big spikes on it, the best, the best mode of action is just to let it be, leave it alone. Um, those spikes are important for its survival because having that venom keeps things from eating it. 
And unfortunately, we look like we may try to eat it and they're not like snakes where they can actively bite. It's us touching is what gets it, able to do that injection. The slug moth. This one's another one. Again, the big, big spikes. They're well-named. They kind of look like a slug. They almost look like a sea slug, um, but venomous caterpillar. The flannel moth. Um, this one is a little tougher because they look fuzzy, but again, really, really hurts. So be really count. Best thing to do, especially if you encounter caterpillars, just watch them, leave them be. Um, even ones that are not a issue of people, we can accidentally hurt them and caterpillars are gonna turn into moths or butterflies and they're important pollinators. So we wanna have as many as we can. So observation is best for all species of, of caterpillar, even if they're not medically significant to us. This one's my favorite. It looks like a toupee that's just gone on an adventure. Uh, the Southern flannel moth. Again, um, looks like a fuzzball. Uh, it doesn't look like something can hurt you. Absolutely can cause some pretty excruciating pain. So that's just something to consider. So if you see a wandering toupee, let it wander because it will hurt if you pick it up. So um, a great way to get, especially if you accidentally, the some of them, they're underneath leaves, you may not see them, but remove those spines. Uh, scotch tape is a really good one. Um, apply, just like the others, apply ice packs to reduce the stinging and um, to help reduce the swelling. Baking soda and water sometimes can help too. But if you have someone who has an issue that may have, um, has a history of allergic reactions, make sure to contact a doctor just because they can have a pretty bad reaction to this. So dangerous snakes. So none of the snakes here shown are venomous. We're pretty fortunate, especially when we would want the, the one on the bottom uh, left hand to be a venomous snake. You don't wanna be that close to a potential venomous snake, but we're pretty good. Um, and an easy way to tell if you are like looking at pictures or things like that, the people. Um, in Ohio, the venomous snakes that we have are gonna be pit vipers. So they're gonna have that triangular head, but the, another big thing is they have the cat eye pupil, the elliptical pupils, the slit. The rest of the snakes are gonna have that round pupil that looks like humans. So all of these snakes have that round pupil, so right away you can tell immediately non-venomous. But again, not the best method. You don't really wanna get close enough to a snake to really be looking at that pupil if you're concerned it might be venomous. Uh, one of the most, in my opinion, gorgeous snakes, the Northern Copperhead. Um, and if you look at that eye, it's, it's pupils are a little bit dilated, but you can see it's like that oval rather than that, that strict round pupil. But in Ohio, Southern Ohio. So in Northwest Ohio, you can see how much in the clear we are. Um, where the dot is, is where they're present in current day. Um, the shaded areas is historical. So we are so out of range of the copperheads, we're in the clear. Um, if you do encounter a copperhead here, it was basically someone who had an illegal pet that released it. Uh, juvenile copperheads actually look a lot different. They don't tend to be as brightly colored, but what's really interesting is they have this kind of yellow tail and they use that tail as a lure to get prey to come to them so they can bite their prey and eat it. But uh, copperheads, if this one's not giving the best view, but copperheads basically have Hershey kisses on their sides. So they have a triangular pattern along their sides that almost look like Hershey kisses. And you can kind of see a little bit of on the top there, that Hershey kiss look. If the snake's stretched out, you can really see it. And even juveniles still have that. So on that side, that darker pattern can look like Hershey kisses. And again, they have that triangular head. It's because they have the pit glands, the heat seeking glands on the side of their heads as well as their venom glands. So they have a distinct triangular head. They're gonna have a neck that you can see and then their body starts versus our non-venomous snakes that kind of have a tubular look. And then you can really see, oops, went too fast. You can really see that cat eye on the juvenile copperhead there. So the timber rattlesnake, again, not super high density here in Ohio, but Southern Ohio. Farther south you go, the, farther, the closer you get to Kentucky and the West Virginia border is where you're most likely to encounter most of our venomous snakes. Um, and if you look at that timber rattlesnake, you're gonna really see that triangular head. Uh, timber rattlers also tend to have a black tail as well. 
with that rattle. The Eastern Massasauga. So this was one of the few venomous snakes we did used to have in Northwest Ohio. However, they really have not been spotted here since the mid eighties. So we are pretty much unlikely, highly unlikely to see them. They were known as a swamp rattler. So this area in particular would have been a good spot for them, but with the lack of this, the draining of the great black swamp and the lack of habitat we have for them now, not very prevalent. Um, they're one of the smaller ones. They're only gonna get about two and a half, three feet long. So the ones can get closer to five, six feet. These guys relatively are tiny compared to the Eastern uh, timber and the Northern Copperhead. So if you've been bitten by a venomous snake and you know you've been bitten by a venomous snake or you highly suspect you've been, um, you're gonna wanna call 911. And that's, they're gonna tell you what to do. Um, trying to keep the potential vi victim calm is the biggest. If they're starting to panic, their heart rate's gonna go up, which is gonna circulate their blood more, which is gonna circulate that venom more. So uh, note that the area is probably gonna swell that's been bitten. So try to remove items specifically around that area as best, like if they're bitten on their ankle, remove their shoe, things like that. Um, don't let the person walk, try to carry them if possible. But again, 911 is going to go through and tell you what to do with them as well. Um, if the snake is dead, make sure to take it with you. Um, but again, don't waste your time hunting down the snake. If you know you heard it rattle here in Ohio, we only have, to, we only have two rattlers in the wild that we have to worry about. So it's the, it's 50, 50, and depending on where you are, uh, you'll know which one it is. So again, don't cut this. So there's a lot of old wives tale on how to deal with snake bites. Tourniquets are not going to work. Don't cut the snake bite. Don't give any medications until directed. Um, and don't attempt to suck out the venom. That's, that, that's not going to work. Um, and again, but the best thing to do if you're bit, especially by a venomous snake, contact 911. They will go from there and they know the specific protocol to do. And they'll tell you what you can do until they get there. Any questions? I know that was a whole bunch of information shoved at you. <laughs>